Hi guys, I'm Dr. Maddy. Welcome back to Doc Off Call. So the second season of the Bucky Hanma series has been announced for Netflix and shall be airing later this year. And so I thought no better time than now to look at and break down some of the science in Bucky's training regimen. So today we'll be looking at the following aspects. What's needed to fuel a body like Bucky's? What his exercise training involves? How we can stimulate our brain's release of endorphins? And lastly, the science of near-death experiences. And of course, there's gonna be a follow-up video answering the question of the benefits of PP training. So if that all sounds appealing, give us a like, comment down below if there's any other aspects of Bucky's training you'd like me to break down. Otherwise, let's begin. <laughs> okay, so we start off with Baki heading up into the mountains to meet with Ando, a friend of his father, Yodra Hanma, and he's come here to get stronger. Why is it in all these shows that for someone to get stronger, they need to go into the wilderness and train? But I guess training in the forest up in the mountains, you're more likely to do functional fitness as opposed to static exercises that you'd do in a conventional gym. And the advantages of doing more functional fitness is that it gives you a well-rounded physique as opposed to potential imbalances with weight training. <laughs> That's right, to develop more strength, you're going to need to put on more weight, and that means increasing your calorie intake. It's all really about the maths. There needs to be more going in than you're expending to be able to put on weight and subsequently develop further muscle. So let's say your normal calorie intake for a day is 2,500 calories. Now it's recommended that when you're going on a bolt that you increase your calorie intake by up to 10 to 20%. So that's gonna look like an increase in about 250 to 500 calories per day. But that's not just 500 calories of crap food, and we'll talk a bit more about diets later on. <laughs> Okay, and now onto the training that Barky starts on. And it looks like he's going with the more traditional methods of resistance and weight training. And the benefits of doing this on a regular basis is that it tells the body that this is the new norm and that it needs to get stronger to cope with this increased demand that we're putting on our bodies. In fact, it's incredible how adaptive the human body and mind are to physical and mental hardship. For example, it's been shown that weight training contributes to bone remodeling and increasing our bone mineral density in our earlier years. In fact, it's recommended that younger people do this to help offset osteoporosis in later life. <laughs> <laughs> and here we go, in true Barky style, the one way of expressing your strength is defeating an animal, whether that's a polar bear, a giant elephant, or in this case, a great ape. But having a goal in your training is really important, as a lot of people who fail to achieve their goals is because they've either set unrealistic expectations of their body or can't decide on a specific goal to stick with. They either want to get shredded or they want to bulk up and get strong. <laughs> Gosh, that's one hell of a way of doing an abdominal crunch. But here we go, this is Barky and Ando's first encounter with the Great Ape. And in all seriousness, a Great Ape is no easy opponent. They're considered to be between 5 to 10 times stronger than the average human being. And it's believed that apes are so powerful that they're able to shatter the human skull with one swing of their arm. <laughs> Bucky, I can't 
Okay, so here we have Bucky disinfecting Ando's wound with some kind of alcohol. And it's interesting because as doctors, we actually advise against using alcohol in open wounds. Now, yes, alcohol is very good at killing off bacteria, but it can have a very damaging effect to the underlying tissues, which can reduce your chances of healing. I'm sure a lot of you have had experience with alcohol gels during the whole COVID pandemic, and it would often lead to a lot of irritation on my hands alone. This is just one example of the damaging effects that alcohol can have on the body's tissues. So yes, this is true, not only just for apes. Cats, dogs and other domestic animals can carry plenty of bacteria on their claws and teeth, which can go on to cause infection. And you've also got to be mindful of things like tetanus and rabies. Now, any of my patients who come through with an animal bite that's drawn blood, I prescribe them antibiotics and I consider whether they need an up-to-date tetanus jab. <laughs> what a badass way to cauterize a wound. But it is a method that was once used to help cauterize a wound when there were no other options available. And it is quite effective at stemming bleeding. However, you've now gone from a bleeding wound to a burnt wound, which in itself is quite dangerous. Now, in my practice, when I perform surgery, we actually use something called diathermy, which is a piece of equipment that passes electricity through two electrodes, and what this does is it zaps the blood vessels, causing a microburn. <laughs> Okay, so Ando's been airlifted off for treatment, leaving Barky behind to fend for himself. And Barky starts by going back onto a bulk, but it looks like he's eating everything in sight. Now, this is something many people mess up on when they're trying to put on weight. Now, the types of food that we eat should really be a mixture of protein, carbohydrate and fats. Despite the fitness industry placing an overwhelming emphasis on your protein intake, you probably only need to take in about one to two grams per kilo of your body weight. Whereas carbohydrates, on the other hand, you need plenty more. And it really needs to be a mixture of carbohydrates. Now, carbohydrates have what's called a glycemic index, which is basically how readily that carbohydrate causes a spike in your blood sugars. For example, a spoon of honey has a very high glycemic index. What that means is that the blood sugar shoots up rapidly and then comes down very quickly also. Now, this would lead to a surge in energy that would be short lasting, whereas a food like porridge or oats has a low glycemic index, which means it gives a sustained release of sugar throughout the day, which fuels you for a lot longer. <laughs> Okay, so this is really interesting. This crossing of the line sounds very similar to a runner's high. And I've covered this topic in one of my previous Hajime no Ippo videos. But simply, it's the idea that we can train our bodies to overcome the pain barriers that limit our exercise. Now, reaching this state, you can get to a point where you become quite euphoric with exercise. And this is due to the release of happy chemicals, otherwise known as endorphins. And these dampen the painful and tiring effects of exercise, allowing us to continue. <laughs> So there's a lot of truth in this scene. In fact, the word endorphins is derived from two words, endogenous and morphine. And this is because endorphins work by acting on the same receptors that morphine acts on. And these morphine receptors are found throughout the body, for example, on the spinal cord. Now, when these are activated, they inhibit pain signals getting to the brain, which allows fighters, as they say, to fight to the death. <laughs> Go 
<laughs> and what a clever way to depict the release of endorphins. It's almost as though you're having a euphoric or pleasurable moment. And the reason it's showing the brain like this is because endorphins are released by both the pituitary and the hypothalamus. And it's interesting because endorphins have also been shown to interact with the dopamine system or the reward system in the brain, which is why we feel great when they get released. <laughs> Ah, and I guess this scene speaks to what I mentioned earlier about endorphins blocking pain signals getting to the brain. But I want to be clear here, endorphins don't prevent you from injuring yourself. You just might not feel the pain when you're getting that endorphin rush. So take care if you ever cross the line. <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny how it's being depicted as though he's having an orgasm every time the endorphins hit. It kind of reminds me of the Lonely Island song, Jizz in My Pants. But interestingly, endorphins are thought to play a role on the impact that exercise has on lifting our mood. And also it's been associated with the increased libido and appetite that you get with working out. <laughs> Again, another interesting point here that helps us separate the men from the boys. Many athletes talk about this X factor that makes them a champion rather than just an athlete. I remember this being spoken about by one of the British boxers, Anthony Joshua. He described that the difference between being a champion and just an athlete is whether you're going to get up after you've been knocked down. You either do or die. And I guess this is another important aspect to talk about. You can almost get addicted to that runner's high. And the problem with that is it can lead you to working out excessively, which can, in of itself, be very damaging to the body. Now the reason why excessive exercise can be damaging is that your body grows and repairs itself whilst you rest. And if you don't rest sufficiently and your muscles don't repair themselves, you're opening yourself up for an injury. God, so to cross the line, Barky needs to jump off this cliff to give himself a near-death experience. This reminds me of world strongman Eddie Hall when he went to go and lift the 500 kilo deadlift. He said that whilst in the gym, his training was failing him until he went to go and seek help from a psychiatrist and hypnotherapist. And what they did was they tricked his brain to access his fight or flight response. Eddie Hall describes that he had to imagine he was deadlifting that weight off his children, which gave him the energy, motivation and activation of his fight and flight response to perform the impossible. So maybe there is some truth to this near death experience training. So yes, there are many accounts of people who've had near-death experiences where they describe seeing a light at the end of the tunnel or their life flashing before their eyes. But is there any science behind why people experience this? Well, it's thought that before we die, there's a marked reduction in blood flow to the head and brain. And as a result, as we slowly begin to lose consciousness and our vision, it can appear as though you're looking through a tunnel, explaining the description of a light at the end of the tunnel. And in terms of our life flashing before our eyes, it's speculated that the first part of the brain that we lose a blood supply from is the area that contains our memories. So what we're actually witnessing is our brains shutting down.
And here we go, a great depiction of light at the end of the tunnel as Barky looks as though he's losing consciousness. And I'm guessing that he's probably losing consciousness here through the shock and realisation that he might die. And again, the way this part is animated with the flashing lights is similar to what you might expect with someone describing their life flashing before their eyes. <laughs> Okay, that's cool. It looks like Barky has accessed this near-death focus. And it looks like it heightens your reflexes and almost slows down your perception of time. And the name near-death focus is really interesting, as we think about time as a concept passing relative to the person who's experiencing it. We can slow it down to a second's experience if we choose to focus on seconds elapsing. And similarly, we can speed it up by not paying attention to the time and being distracted. So is near-death focus possible? I would say with training and meditation, hell yeah! And so he survives his near-death experience, leading to the next step in evolution of Bucky's training. And it looks like just in time to fight the great ape. Okay, sorry to leave you there on a cliffhanger, but I promise you more videos like this are coming soon. Don't forget to look out for my Barky PP training video coming next week, but otherwise, these two videos should keep you entertained in the meantime. Thanks!